The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. And all of a sudden, I, I was just standing there. I stopped for a second. I was just standing there, and I looked in the window at this tattoo shop, and I saw this tattoo, and I was like, my dad's not going to be right about this. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it forever. I didn't mean to get it and you know, so serious, but no, that's good. Yeah. Did it hurt getting it on your ball sack or what exactly? Uh, it was the taint. <laughs> that was <Okay>. the part. <laughs> What's up, besties? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Child Like It Best with Mike Valdez. And guess what? I am still the second part of that title. I'm so excited about today's guest. But before we get there, I just wanted to let you know we have new merch, ladies and gentlemen. You can go to childlikewonder.co to see the full collection. There's Viewmaster collection. There is some church merch collections. And there is also a shirt with my face on it uh, that says comedy's favorite cartoon. So check that out and support if you can. Also, follow me on social media. I'm at Mike Valdez on Instagram. I'm at official Mike Valdez on TikTok. You can watch my comedy. You can watch music. You can watch a whole bunch of different things. You can also find out when I'm coming to your town and you can watch me do stand up live or play music live. And if you don't see your city anywhere, talk to either your local venue, your local comedy club and let them know that you want to see me. So that way we can get everybody coming to Mike Valdez comedy shows. That would be really, really awesome. Now that we have that out of the way, today's guest is Scott Henry. I'm so excited about this episode. Scott Henry is the co-founder and co-creator of the Big Comedy Network. So essentially, he's my boss. And essentially, I kind of had to do this interview. But no, I'm kidding. I did not have to do this interview. I actually asked him quite literally before big comedy was even made. Uh, and we, this is kind of an older recorded episode. In fact, so much so that I had to cut a lot of stuff out because big comedy network actually used to be called the comedy lounge, which was founded on clubhouse, which is an app that nobody uses anymore. So, uh, I had to kind of cut all that out because at that point we were still on clubhouse and it was still going strong. But Big Comedy Network is now a new thing, and it is a bigger thing and a better thing, in my opinion. Um, in fact, so much so that Big Comedy Network has Child Like It Best, and they forced me to do video. So uh, if you're watching this on video, then you are part of my nightmare because I never wanted to be on video, but Big Comedy Network wanted me to do it. And so I was like, sure, absolutely. Why not? Nevertheless, more about Scott Henry. Scott Henry is an amazing comedian who has been in this business as long as I've been alive, which is a lot. Um, that's really, it's really wild. He's been in this business for quite some time. Uh, he's toured with some amazing comedians and he has some great stories in this podcast. Some uh, names that you might recognize like Gary Goldman or Burt Kreischer or Gary Valentine, uh, Kevin James, you know, people like that. There's uh, quite uh, interesting and funny stories that we get into. And I really think that you guys are going to love this episode. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with the very funny and the very much my boss. <laughs> He's not really my boss. <laughs> I'm my own boss. <laughs> anyway, Scott Henry, everybody. We were talking maybe a couple weeks ago, and you were saying that you had done some shows recently, and you had been sleeping for so long, and you're like, have you, like, you're, you said, have you ever slept so much that you get headaches from sleeping? <laughs> And I was yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I've yeah. just been sleeping the whole time. <laughs> yeah. That's a so couple funny. Weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I got on the ship on a Sunday and didn't do a show until Wednesday. Oh, and my it was only gosh. A, yeah, I did a 40 minute set. And then the next day I got off the ship. Okay. But that was another day where I was. That's why that day that I hopped in with you, mm. it was like five in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was I, yeah, I remember it was super early when we were when we were talking for sure. No, it's it's funny because like, I don't know, man, I how how were shows for you when you first got back? Rusty. 
Yeah. <laughs> the first show I did was in Indianapolis. And thank God there was a, a table of drunk women in front. Yeah. Uh, no, you'll never hear any comic say that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but this particular night, it was a good thing because the, the one girl, the mom was an outlaw. And, oh, no. and the daughter was like, I was a dentist and had a very successful practice and she was wearing her mask and the other women weren't. And I go, you're just wearing the mask because of embarrassment. Are you? And she goes, yes, <laughs> yes. I do not want anybody to know we're related. That's and so funny, dude. So I made it through it, but, uh, it was scary. And then, um, when I did this show, a corporate gig for up at the Columbus funny bone, yeah. And it was for a bunch of builders, which was perfect for me. Yeah. Because all I did was I go up and I go, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, I'm going to tell jokes here in a minute, but uh, I got a little delay on my, uh, you know, my jokes coming in. They're coming in off the bus any or <laughs> off the truck any minute. They should be here. Yeah. And usually I have a guy bring them to me. So it's going to take a minute longer for That's me to great. get all my jokes here. Cause, That's so and they, funny. They just howled, you know, because I'm sure, man. That's yeah, what you're builders very, do. They just tell you they're going to build and they avoid. Yeah, you're a very, you're a very guy's guy kind of comedian you know like yeah. uh like you're you're like the funniest guy at the at the construction site you know what i mean that, that was me except for it yeah. was a machine shop i was a tool and die uh yeah. trying to be a tool and die maker so yeah i love that dude i um well i want to kind of get to know you more um you know we talk about childhood on this show and things like that um but i want to kind of go through your whole career and all that stuff because you interest me scott henry and uh, and so i want to ask you this where did you grow up i grew up in a little town in milwaukee called west alice wisconsin okay and west alice wisconsin was now they call it the dirty stalice uh, I don't know why, um, <laughs> but I grew up in a, you know, a tiny house. Um, it's funny. You don't know what kind of property your parents owned until you get older. You know I what I mean? Know. Yeah. But, I mean, we had a, we had an overpass of a freeway a hundred yards that way. Whoa. We had train tracks about 200 yards that way. You know what I mean? And I just thought that's the way it was. But I, little oh did I know gosh. that's property values are not great. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but we, you know, I, you know, I wanted for nothing. I, you know, had a motorcycle when I was, when I was five years old and my dad was, my mom and dad were bikers, you know, like my, you know, they had jobs and shit, you know, right. but, <laughs> but my mom rode on the back smoking nails and, you know. <laughs> If my dad went too fast, like 78, 80 miles an hour, I'd blow her cigarette out. She'd be pissed. Um, but I just had a normal upbringing, you know, with my, I guess, normal with my two older <laughs> sisters. That's so funny. You're like, you're like, both of my parents smoked. I had a motorcycle when I was five. I had a normal childhood. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, both parents smoking was not a thing. We used to just yeah. sit in that <laughs> tiny living room. I mean. This house was small. Like I go back there now and I'm like, oh my gosh, right. I have no idea how big it was. But we had three bedrooms, one bathroom and three women. We had wow. three women in the house with one bathroom. Wow. And so, and my, uh, it was, you know, it was, uh, we, you know, I could walk to my school and it was really safe neighborhoods. And yeah. That's good. And we used to shovel snow to make money and deliver newspapers to make money. It was, you know, pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, I love that. When did you, this is, this is funny. I never have met anyone with an actual paper route. When did you start your paper route? I had a couple different ones. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> one was, yeah, the first one was, it was called The Post, okay. which was just one of those terrible newspapers that had fillers in them and, and they were free and mm -hmm. you just dumped that on everybody's door and that one. And now I was the smallest kid in my school always. Yeah. I mean, my, when I was in seventh grade, I weighed 70 pounds, 10th grade, I weighed 95 pounds. Jeez. Finally, by the time I was a senior, I weighed 132. I, I was like a skin squirrel. I was a you know good Jeez. athlete. I wrestled, but yeah, I was always a small. So I had that paper dude, that was like in the movie Caddyshack when the kid tries to pick up Rodney's bag. <laughs> yeah. okay? And they used to make fun of me so bad. They used to make fun of me so bad. But I did that. But then B 
before I went to school, I had, they dropped the papers off. I put them in the bag and then I get on my bike and I deliver that stuff at like six in the morning. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was unbelievable, but I was making money and, you know, I, but it was a tough job because I was so small and those papers were so heavy. You know, it was funny about the, the Setno route being in the morning. You'd see people without clothes on or in their underwear <laughs> yeah. more than you ever wanted to see anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure. like ladies coming, you know, you open the door and she wants to get her paper and the robe flies completely open. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, you know what I mean? I mean, when <laughs> well, you're that you know- age. You probably know more than anyone. The people you see naked are the people you never want to see naked. No. So- <laughs> yeah. Nude beaches. That's yeah. a nude beach is basically, it's basically a, a before picture for everyone. <laughs> so you were talking about how you uh, were kind of like a slim kid growing up and things like that, but... Who did you hang out with at school? Like, what, what? who did you sit with at the lunch table? Like, that kind of thing. Um, the athletes. Okay. All of us jocks hung out together. But I was an anomaly because I, w- I liked to sing. I was a singer. Oh, cool. Um, I love to perform, you know. Um, I Since I was in fifth grade, every single year from – I'm sorry, since kindergarten. Every single year from kindergarten to sixth grade in grade school – I did a solo in what they'd call the spring sing and then the, awesome. the Christmas, you know, whatever they called it. Yeah. And uh, I still remember like uh, the one when I was five years old and I had to take that, you know, that brown paper that's in a big roll. <laughs> yeah. Right? And then yeah. Uh, we would we'd cut it in a big circle and then I would and then you cut a place for your head. Oh my and I, gosh. I had to draw what my version of a donkey was, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I had to put that on my head, okay? And that's what I sang with. It was, I am the donkey, shaggy and brown. I carry my mother up hill and down. I carry my mother to Bethlehem town. I am the donkey, oh, shaggy and brown. And that's I was like, what's up? Mm-hmm. Hilarious. Oh my God. <laughs> Not, also, not to mention, I've been to many a churches, and I have never heard that song. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I you don't know where that came new. from. That's <clears throat> I think. that's amazing. I love that, dude. I yeah. yeah i I did not know that about you. That's so interesting. I didn't yeah. know that you grew up singing uh, all the time. Yeah. Singing, uh, I liked. It you makes know, it's plenty just... of sense. You have uh, you have a great speaking voice so you can Thank usually you. tell by people's speaking voice if they can sing and it makes perfect sense that you would have this like low register kind of like you know soul like rock and roll kind of voice but i just didn't know if that was like a thing that you did or not i can rock a little frank sinatra pretty good Hell um yeah. you know some of that stuff but you know i just loved to perform and it was kind of a strange thing amongst my uh, athlete buddies, um, that they were like, you know, I don't want to tell you what they'd call me, you know, oh, yeah, because, of because I was doing I was that. Called those things too. Yeah. And, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, they'd have plays and I would get in that and do all the stuff. And we, you know, we do wizard of Oz and I'd be like, follow the yellow brick road, you know? Right. And, and then, and then I was like, what if we had commercials, you know? And their <laughs> teacher's like, what? You know, so I'm like adding on to her plays and stuff. But, you know, I used to get my butt, you know, I used to get in fights all the time because I had a big mouth. But I also, you know, didn't want to back down from people. And, you know, when you're small, people take advantage of you. And so, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's so funny because like. You know, going back, going back to that whole thing, that's something that was very similar to me is that, um you know, people, people would definitely make fun of me for being the singer of, of like the group or like being the, the actor or whatever. But in my head, I was like, dude, I'm like the only guy in a room full of women. How is that gay at all? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, in fact, this is no lie, Scott Henry. Uh, the reason why I joined choir in the first place, like, I didn't even know that I wanted to be a singer in sixth grade. I just in sixth grade 
uh, the choir teacher came up to me and said, you, you seem like you have a really good singing voice or whatever. She heard me singing at church or I don't know what it was, but she heard, she heard me doing something. And she was like, you have a great voice. You should join the choir. And I was like, nah, I don't really want to do that. I'll probably get made fun of. And she's like, well, we don't have any guys. And then I was like, uh, that means all girls. Absolutely. And that's 100% why I joined choir and why I fell in love with music. So, you know, a, <laughs> a lot of guys did that. A lot of yeah. guys did that. You know, I just, I, you know, the bad thing was, is like, I had met Bob Euchre when I was a kid because he was our uh, the Brewers announcer. Mm-hmm. And I met him when I was a kid and I was like, that's what I'll be doing, right. you know? And because I loved to perform, I loved, you know, I loved to talk. I uh, had, you know, I, I just, you know, I love the dog. <laughs> no, I, I love that. I mean, and, and th- here's, this is a question too, is like, you know, because you, you love talking, you're obviously, you know, you're obviously comedic, you know, you're, you're using comedy as a defense mechanism, at least I would assume uh, at school Plenty. and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, cause that's what I was doing as well. Did you know at a young age that you wanted to be a comedian? Um, not at a young age. Sure. Uh, a young age, I wanted to be a performer. I wanted right. to do something that didn't have to do with studies. Sure. You know what I mean? Me too. I, I wanted to be <laughs> a singer. I wanted to be a baseball announcer. Uh, yeah. I wanted to just be a performer in general, yeah. actor. Um, I still remember... And this will tell you everything you need to know about my parents. My mom worked <laughs> at Sears. My dad was a machinist, okay? okay. That was... Wow. This was a blue collar city. There was it really was, huh? it was you, you got done with school and you did good and you graduated for great sakes. <laughs> and then you go get a damn job and you get your insurance <laughs> and you get a pension. Now don't jack it up, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I remember I was watching like, I don't know what it was, the show family or uh, eight is enough or family ties or something like that. Yeah. And I just sat there and I was looking at that and I just saw myself in one of those shows. Yeah. I think I was 10 or 10 or 12. And right in the middle of the show, I just stood up and I said, I'm going to have my own television show one day. (laughs) I'm going to be an actor and I'm going to move to California and I'm going to have a show, my own show, just like this. And my mom goes, oh, that's good, honey. (laughs) <laughs> my dad's like get out of the way of the tv right now <laughs> so so they were very supportive is yes. my point <laughs> of course of course <laughs> no i i had a very similar thing i mean that that happened to me as well i i didn't like get up and and think like i want to be on tv or anything but it was like more of like an internal thought um I think I've told this story before, but I, I, when I was a kid, I was very indecisive. And so, which makes a lot of sense, even as myself as a performer, because you're just like, okay, so Mike writes music. He's an actor. He's this, he's that. So you could call me indecisive. You can call me talented if you want, but you could also call me indecisive. Um, so that's kind of how I was when I was growing up where I was like, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be a lawyer or whatever. And I was mostly getting a lot of these ideas from movies. And then one day it just finally clicked where I was like, if I'm an yes. actor, I could be yes. anything, you know? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's 100%. You know, when I was a kid, that was like the click, you know? And I think the movie that really did that for me was, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal in October Sky. I don't know if you've ever seen oh that movie. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, dude, that movie's I, I so good. I got a great good. story about that movie. Please, go ahead, go ahead. please, please. No, I, go, I would but, love no, to hear it. Finish your thought, though. I want to hear. No, that's the only. Music. That's the only thought I had was just okay. that was one of my favorite movies growing up. So, I go to see this movie with my friend John Manfrelotti, who uh, is a, he's a New York-based comic. LA for the last 25 years, but he came up with Ray Romano and their best friends. And so he was on everybody loves Raymond and all that other kind of stuff, but Mm -hmm. he was on uh, men of a certain age as well. And he's very funny. Yeah. He's, he's a skinny one. He played Manfro and he was like, yeah, Manfro was like, 
you know, like everything he had a comment when yeah. I was pitched out uh, and this is a back way to go about it, but I want to explain the guy that is who I went Please. with. All right? Yeah. So Johnny is the kind of guy that always has some sort of just, I, I don't want to say negative, but just a funny jab. So one time yeah. I was with uh, my friend, Mike Siegel, Mm-hmm. And I was with Johnny and and I was like, so what's going on, Mike? And he goes, yeah, I just moved. I got this new apartment. And I go, where is it? And he goes, oh, it's actually just a block away. And we we're on our way to like El Coyote. No, not El Coyote. Uh, 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 Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a little bar and uh, off of Melrose. And I was like, well, let's go over and see it. Why don't you check it out? And he goes, oh, all right. So we walk over there. We go in. And I was like, this is really nice. And Johnny goes, yeah, this is a nice place to OD. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So when I when I had one of my sitcoms uh, to pitch one of my friends, it was John, and I used that line in the movie. Yeah. And so, um, but anyway, so I go to the Beverly Connection to go see this movie with Johnny. And boy, if you have any issues with your dad oh yeah you watch this movie and mm-hmm. you watch it i right now it's starting to get me yeah right? you watch this movie this kid growing up in a mining town mm-hmm. right where let me tell you something about that mine you know uh chris and uh and then when he sees when chris uh what's his name uh the actor uh the dad i forget it's uh oh. it's christopher something i'll think of it yeah i'll think of it uh but when he sees that rocket yeah. go up and the look on his face, it's like it was just like when I told my dad that I had signed this deal with ABC. He just didn't yeah. even know what to do with it. It was like beyond, yeah. he was like, that, that actually happened? Yeah. That actually happened. And then yeah. I, you know, told him what I was getting for it. So it was like, I watched that movie and I can't stop crying. And I know it's Johnny, so I, I don't want him to see me. So I'm just sure. kind of leaning on my hands. So, <laughs> and I think I'm, and dude, I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm trying to hide it. Right. And of course we got the one seat, you know, gap between us. So I think I'm selling it. Right. Yeah. So we get out of the movie and we walk and it's silent. We don't say anything to each other. We get like outside of the Beverly connection and we're walking up. Do you know Los Angeles at all? Yeah, I do. All right. Do you know where the Beverly center is? I uh, believe down so. At, yeah. In La Cienega. And I come out and we walk about a half a block. Can we curse on this or no? You can say whatever you want, dude. He goes, by the way, you are the biggest fucking pussy I have ever <laughs> seen. <in my> life. <laughs> Oh, and I was howling. I I was because I was so I just the the energy, the tension. Yeah, I don't know if he was going to he was going to try and be nice about it or if he just was like, no, no, we got to nip this in the bud right now. We got to we got to handle this. This cannot ever happen again. (laughs) Hilarious. Oh, my God. That's so funny, dude. Yeah, man, that um. That movie, that movie does a lot for me. Do you, uh, do you usually get emotional during movies? Yes. Yeah. I get, I get emotional about a lot of things. I, I, I take on things really well. That's why I want, yeah. that's why I feel like as an actor, uh, it's like, uh, it's what, the same way I listen to music and lyrics. Um, mm-hmm. like it's why I like, you know, I like the band Incubus a lot. They're yep. great writers. I like the band Radiohead a lot. I like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Rush a lot because the lyrics, <laughs> Where it's why I don't love country music because it's so sure. in your face. Right. Like, you know, they tell the story with with the words instead right. of with poetry or what they're not saying with in you know with um with gaps in there right. like acting does. You're supposed yeah. to take on that life and figure out what it means to you. Right. And and that's why I love you know it's why when when it came to acting, I wanted to do comedy, but I also liked drama a lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, and so, some of the best, I, I mean, you you know this, but some of the best dramatic people are comedians, you know? Mm-hmm. Like that's just, we un, we understand drama because <laughs> we've already done the hardest thing, which is make that drama funny, <laughs> yeah. you know? 
Like our, that's our the hardest lives. thing. Yeah, that's the hardest yeah. thing to do. You know, so yep. I mean, that's why like it really bothers me and I'm sure it it probably bothers you too, but like it really bothers me that like the academy doesn't give two shits about comedy, you know, and things like that and it's like, dude, do you understand how hard comedy is? Like to yeah. make people laugh is so hard, you know? And like yep. You know, it's just, I don't know, man. I mean, and we've had many a conversation about like how, like, you know, the Jackass movies or like, you know, Bad Grandpa and like stuff like that. Like, yeah. why in the world shouldn't that get a claim? You know, like it's making people laugh. You know, it, yeah. it makes people get through horrible things, you know? Yeah. So it's, I don't know, man. That's just it, me. Yeah, I, I don't understand it either. There's, uh, there's plenty of movies that are comedies where people make transformations Yeah, and people, you write about something deep and you write about, you know, the loss of a family or, you know, something like that. And, you know, I think <clears throat> the comedy tragedy masks, mm -hmm. I have that tattoo and yeah. I have that tattoo because when I first started comedy, I went to a play, you know, I had finally gotten these colleges yeah. And, you know, when back then colleges were like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to make so much money doing this. You are. Yep. You'll make so much money. And so I went back to Wisconsin and I was to a place called Carroll College. And I went and I don't know if you've ever seen an airplane hit the side of a mountain. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's what that's what this performance was like. It was striker. You're coming in too low. And you could just I could see it's just people going, no. And so I left, I left there and I just walked, I didn't even get my check. Oh, I just no. left. Like I'm supposed to meet with a student activities board, you know, person, the head of that and then get my check. I just walked off stage and I left the college and I started walking down around uh, downtown Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is a little place where, where JJ Watt is from actually. Yeah. And the Watt family and, and some of what Les Paul is from there as well. And so I'm walking around and I'm like, that's it. I'm quitting. This is, you know, stupid. I'm, I suck. And I don't ever want to experience that ever again. And I'm just quitting. I'm going to go back and be a machinist, you know? And I started walking around for like an hour, just walking in circles because it's downtown Waukesha is tiny. And all of a sudden, I, I was just standing there. I stopped for a second. I was just standing there, and I looked in the window at this tattoo shop. And I saw this tattoo, and I was like, my dad's not going to be right about this. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it forever. And that's going to be a tattoo is forever. Yeah. So... I got that tattoo on, on my body. And, and, uh, and that was my, I was like, this is it. This is permanent. You're not, yeah. you're not leaving this one. You're going to finish this one. And so yeah. that was that. I didn't mean to get it. And, you know, so serious, but. No, that's good. Yeah. Did it hurt getting it on your ball sack or what exactly? Uh, it was the taint. <laughs> that was <Okay>. the part. <laughs> You set me up so quickly. I had to do it. <laughs> I wish I would have waxed first. Yeah. Let me just say that. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny, dude. I I love that. Oh, my God. That's that's so funny, uh, man. One of my favorite things that I've talked to you about is like we because, you know, you always talked about like how you do a whole bunch of corporate gigs and I've only done a few, but there you when you reminded me of like <laughs> playing that college and the the airplane hitting the side of a mountain uh, it really reminded me about this corporate gig that I did where it was so bad that the fun was how bad I could make it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and like that's I don't think unless you're a comedian you'll ever like people will understand this but for the listener there is something about how when a show is going so bad that as a comic the thrill is how how can I make these people despise me like <laughs> like and that's like yeah. the thrill you know have you had moments like that as well I you know I wish I could get to that place. I had my friend, 
my friend KP Anderson yeah. <laughs> used to do showcases, which is why he's a phenomenal producer and show creator. Yeah. But he used to do shows like showcases and he did like a Dennis Miller type of act and very heady and, yeah. you know, and then, so he would start the showcase and by two minutes in, if it wasn't going the way that he liked it to go, <laughs> I mean, he'd just start lobbing bounce <laughs> and just shred it. But for me, I just still tried to get him. Yeah. You know, that that's where I was. I mean, there's in a comedy club, though. Yeah. I'll just go. OK. Yeah. We're going to well, I'm sitting here. I'm going there's, nowhere. There's some I mean, dude, there's got to be some shows. I mean, I've I've never done this, um, but I've had uh, some friends that have told me about like New Year's being the worst show ever to do. Oh, they're like, it's glorified babysitting, dude. Yeah. Like, it's like awful. You know, yeah. and thank God I've never been asked to do it. But like, I mean, yeah, I mean, the only time I, for the most part, to be fair, for the most part, I usually want people to be on my side. My comedy is not very like I hate you or like, you know, like it's not very like dark or vulgar, you know, like it's just it's very silly. It's very whimsical. But <clears throat> The thing is, if you're if you don't strap into how silly it's going to be, it's going to be a rough 30 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so yeah. um, and so that's kind of what happened at this corporate gig. Um, and who cares? It was for Coca-Cola. And <laughs> and these people were so mean like i mean they were like calling me names i mean things that i shouldn't bear what? repeating oh yeah it was bad it was real bad and um it was for one of their like uh they had like a retreat or whatever and uh and it was it was only like maybe 20 people and it was like in this mm -hmm. really small room so it was awful already mm -hmm. and so they're just they're calling me names i mean all kinds of horrible stuff and then i i never thought i'd say this ever but i <laughs> I, I literally said, fuck Coca-Cola. I'm drinking Pepsi for the rest of my life. And then I just left. <laughs> I want to go into our next bit real quickly. Um, mm -hmm. What were your favorite snacks growing up? Oh, I loved. I've always been a Twix guy. Sure. Love Twix. I love those little carousel cookies. Remember those? I don't believe so. What they're are shaped those? in like animals. They're pink and white. They come in a box. Well, they used to oh, go in a dude, box. Dude, yes, and they're you're pink right. And white. Yeah, they're, they're so, so good. good. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved mandarin oranges. Of course. Those were so good. And I used to, my neighbor had an apple tree, mm -hmm. a plum tree, a cherry uh, tree, yeah. um, blueberries. And are not blueberries, no, uh, raspberries. And there was something else. So I used to, they were an older couple, so they didn't really eat. So I used to constantly pull down fruit. And then <laughs> I would get on my bike. I'd have a whole bag of fruit like this, and I'd get on my bike, and I'd go down to the playground. And so everybody called me Fruit Fly because I was so small, <laughs> and I'd always have a bag of fruit. You were so the hero, for I sure. I was the Fruit Fly. Yeah, that's um, so fun. You know what? Uh, what else I loved was Taco Bell. Sure. That yeah. was, you know, that was Even a big deal. Even as a deal. kid or just like when you were a teenager? Especially. No, well, I think I was probably 12 years old the first time I had sure. it. Sure, yeah. And then I would ride my bike because I would ride my bike all the way to Taco Bell, which was a long way, and, yeah. order, and just get, I don't even know, like box of tacos and just. Oh, yeah. You know, finish the whole thing. Well, you it was can, just you can murder. You can murder a box of tacos for like five bucks mm -hmm. when back then. Like it yeah. was, they're still pretty cheap, regardless. Um, yeah. But we just yeah. drove back from West Virginia yesterday, mm -hmm. and um, when we got into town, I was like, "Babe, we got to eat something. What do you want to eat?" And she goes, "Taco Bell." Mm -hmm. 
we got two burrito supremes, six tacos, and four bean burritos. Yeah. It's like fourteen bucks. And what'd you get <laughs> and what'd you get, Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> Diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> you set me up. I had to do it. <laughs> um, so you know this about me, but one of my favorite things to talk about on this show specifically is cereal. So mm. what were your favorite cereals growing up? Apple Jacks and Cap'n Crunch. Hell yeah, dude. St- are they still yeah. your favorites? Uh, well, Cap'n Crunch I haven't had in 100 years. My favorite now is Cinnamon Life. <laughs> And uh, it's good. Very underrated cereal. It's a very I think good it cereal. Is. Yeah, it's yeah, a very good I mean, cereal. Cinnamon Life. I would only eat the Cinnamon Life after my roof of my mouth was too toe up right. from eating from eating Cap'n Crunch. You know what ain't I mean? That ain't that the truth, man? <laughs> yeah. And so that's so uh, true. Yeah, but those two were my my favorites. Um, now I love Cinnamon Life and. That's pretty much all Honey Nut Cheerios. So yeah, I got to, you course. know, when you're old, you know, it's like when you're old, <laughs> when if you, you're old, <laughs> you eat any more stuff like that and your sugar goes through the friggin' roof. Well, and then I you're mean, kink. it's funny because like, I mean, my personal opinion is like, I still think Honey Nut Cheerios and Cinnamon Life are fine. They're mm-hmm. not old people cereals. I don't even think Raisin Bran is an old people cereal. I think old people cereals are like the cereals that have a picture of a farm and a Bible verse on the back. Like, that is old people cereal. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. Uh, like Honey Nut Cheerios is fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure, it's not cookies for breakfast, the cereal, but it's still, no. you know. <laughs> yeah. But Apple Jacks, I thought were phenomenal. Yeah, you they know, still are. Yeah, and like uh, my sister would do the fruity pebbles. Yeah. And I was like, that was just a little much for me. Yeah, you know, I, I just, get that. But but Count Chocula, oh, when so I was, good. When I before I had graduated to life, you know, uh, and but Count Chocula, it was a natural progression, you know, uh, you know, Count Chocula, Fruity Pebbles, Apple Jacks, Captain Crunch, Life. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was that far from from grape nuts, you know. <laughs> yeah, dude, grape nuts. Grape nuts is harsh. It's uh, yeah. it's good, but it is harsh. It is like yeah. eating a tree trunk. It is real yeah. harsh. And the, um, the only cereal that old people eat, you know, is stuff that helps you poop. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> That's very true. It's that truth. is very true. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, every episode of this podcast, I like to review a box of cereal with my guest. I don't know if you okay. know this, Scott. I didn't um, know. No. So uh, I usually like to get a box of cereal that has something to do with my guest in some way, shape or form. So I spoke with my sponsors over at Quaker. Uh, Now, by sponsor, I mean that I like them and I buy all of their products. And by spoke to, I mean that I tweeted them repeatedly and they never got back to me. (laughs) So the cereal that I chose for you is... Chocolate caramel crunch. Oh my gosh! Yeah, dude. <laughs> I don't even know that. I, I I mean, I don't know. My wife would even allow me to have that. <laughs> yeah. So I got this for you for a myriad of reasons. One, because I would say you are the captain of the comedy lounge. Um, and considering that there is no hierarchy in the comedy lounge, that's why you're not the colonel. That's why you're not the admiral. Uh, you know, okay. like you, you're just the captain, you know? That's right. <laughs> exactly. And I love so, it. and also, um, chocolate and caramel it's a mixture of flavors and if i know your taste in women you like mixing flavors i do (laughs) i do so so there you go those are the reasons why i chose this for you um one other thing that i'm like that cereal is i could my act could make you die from diabetes oh no 
<laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. Um, especially your Golden Corral bit for sure. That'll de- that'll definitely make you die of the beatus for sure. Oh. Um, so let's see here. Uh, just let me show you the back here. There's uh, there's some sort of uh, chocolate diarrhea Ooh. fountain that they're going through there. Um, that is the the chocolate caramel lake or or pond or whatever. River. It says uh, yeah river. It says uh, chocolate caramelville, you know, or whatever it says. Uh, Chocolatize me, Captain, uh, is what is what it says in the front here. Um, so, you know, I think it would be fun to review this box of cereal, but we're Zoom conferencing right now, so we can't right. eat the cereal. So what I figure we can do is uh, I would like for you to do an ad for chocolate caramel crunch. Um and I would like for you to do it as Captain Crunch. Um, so, and once this is all edited and everything, I'll put music behind it. This is going to sound incredible. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, whenever you are ready, uh, why don't you uh, give us an ad read for this serial? You can do whatever you'd like, say whatever you'd like. Uh, just uh, let the listeners know that they okay. should have Chocolate Caramel Crunch. Have you ever woke up and you're crazy, crazy hungry <laughs> and you're feeling just a little down? Well, I'd recommend some extra sugar in the large size box. <laughs> Chocolate caramel crunch. Hey, <laughs> mateys, get on the man. Will you just take your chocolatize me cup and have a milk with it? Lactose intolerant? Who cares? <laughs> it's chocolate caramel crunch. Yum, yum. I love it, dude. I love it. Chocolate caramel crunch, ladies and gentlemen. They said it couldn't be done. They were probably right, but we did it. Um, that is so silly, dude. So I want to talk a little bit more about comedy. When was it that you started? Uh, first time I ever went on stage, I believe, was in 1987. Okay. I went to a comedy co- well. That was the year I was born, by the way. Cup. Was it really? <laughs> yes, it was. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Holy cow. <laughs> um, so I was I was a machinist at the time and uh, and I, I I hated it. Yeah. I was not. And, you know, the guy that owned the company, last name is Coleman, and I went to school with his kids and they knew, you know, they knew. Yeah. Well, he came out one day and he said, uh, Hey Scott, um, me and uh, me and my wife went to this new comedy club they opened downtown last night, and we both thought of you. Thought maybe you know Scott, you should go down there. And, you know, you you know you do funny voices, and you know you do impressions of the customers, which we wish you didn't do, but <laughs> you still do good ones. <laughs> and uh, and he goes, and I heard you have a pretty good impression of me as well. But let's move on from all that. He goes, but you should go down there. And so I took my high school girlfriend and we went to see the show and it was John Mendoza. Okay. Manny Alavera and Doby Maxwell. Okay. And Alavera went up and then Doby comes out and he goes, Hey, we have open mic night every Monday. And so my high school girlfriend was like, you should do this. And I go, really? She goes, you should do this. You are, you're funnier than that first guy. That second guy, sec, that other guy was pretty good, but you, you should do this. And then the following week I did it and I sucked awful. I mean, just awful. Yeah. And then I did it again and I did it again and, and, uh, and started getting some idea of what was going on. Started doing impressions and, uh, really bad ones too. Like here's an impression, you, you know, Tony Montana is right from Scarface. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Here's Tony Montana going through the drive through at McDonald's. I had a Big Mac, a large fry, and a lot of Coke. Um, so <laughs> so I did so that. I did, I did Rodney. Um, I did Howie Mandel. Um, uh, just a bunch of people, you know, and started getting it. And then they asked me to be the house MC. And back then, Tuesday through Sunday, Tuesday through Sunday. And so I worked nine hours during the day. I, you know, come home, go for a run, 
do a bunch of push-ups and stuff and sit-ups and then, you know, take a nap and go to the comedy club. And I did that every single week for a year. And then I went and auditioned for Ron Denunzio at the Punchline, Ron and Chris. And uh, he gave me a couple of weeks and I went and did Birmingham and Mo uh, Birmingham and Mobile, Alabama. And I went home and he said, yeah, you did good. And so I kept calling him and calling me. He's like, what? He goes, all right, I'll give you two more weeks. And I go, I didn't know how it worked as such an ignorant person. Right. And I go, two weeks, Ron, because he booked 13 clubs. I go, two weeks, dude. I said, I used up all my vacation. I said, I, you know, I need to, I, I need, you know, I need as much as you can give me. And he goes, I get a kick out of you, Henry. He goes, is this what you want to do? And I said, Ron, if I stay here, I'm going to drive my motorcycle into a bridge at 100 miles an hour. I can't do this. <laughs> and I was, I mean, I was like, I can't do this. I've gotten myself in a situation here and I don't know how to get out of it, but I know I love comedy. Yeah. And he goes, okay. And he gave me two weeks in each one of his clubs and that was a wrap. So 26 wow. weeks of work and I left. And the first year I worked 47 weeks. Dude, Cause that's it just crazy. started getting, cause if you worked at the, if you worked for Ron, Ron and Chris, any club would take you. Yeah. Any, they were like, Oh, you work. Oh, you over the, Oh yeah. All right, cool. And then I started working here and there and there. And it just, it just grew. That's yeah. so awesome, dude. I mean, and not only that, like, did you, at one point, did you move to New York to do comedy or Los Angeles or where did you, is that where you LA, moved? baby. Yeah. You moved LA. to LA dude, because I wanted to move to, yeah. No, the only reason why I ask is because um, I know that you had also worked with a bunch of people that have, you know, also gone on to be names now, like Gary Goldman and, and uh, Burt Kreischer, Gary Valentine, you know, all those people. So I was just wondering if you met them in Los Angeles or New York. Yeah, I knew all those guys. I was mm -hmm. at Montreal with Gary. We did yeah. new faces. Listen to this lineup. Me, Gary Goldman, Daniel Tosh. Gabriel Iglesias. Holy cow. Dwayne Perkins. Jeez. That's solid. That's a whole right? people. That's like a whole list of killers, dude. That's so good. Yeah. And Gary Valentine was like my best friend out there. And that's yeah. how I you know, knew Kevin. But I knew those guys. It was all Los Angeles. I actually I, I told your wife about this where I was I was watching Burt Kreischer has a cooking show that's really that's relatively popular on YouTube. And uh, and your name came up uh, when he had uh, Gary Goldman on and he was like, dude, I, I remember we went on this trip. It was me and uh, Gary Valentine and Scott Henry and then uh, and, and then Mike Burton. And, and Mike, Mike Burton. Burton, that's who it was. And and um and Gary Goldman said, Oh my god, I remember Scott Henry. I can I could tell you every single word from his act. I've seen his act so many times. <laughs> so it's like it's so cool because like for one, it made me laugh as a comedian because that believe it or not, that is how we know each other. Like I I'm more prone to hearing someone's act and being like, I've met that guy before, before I ever saw your face. Or mm -hmm. like knew your name, you know, like mm -hmm. I know your act, you know, um, because we're just in it the whole time. And so, yeah, they had nothing but good things to say about you and oh, in that nice. podcast. But they they told this story that is hilarious about how, like, I think I think Mike Burton hid in the back of a car. Is that what it was in the back of a yep. car? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, I mean, please. And Gary, you... and Gary got in the car. We went and picked him up. And Gary's like, you know, Burton, man, I don't know what Burton is. Uh, you know, his his act is just this. And if he just did that, you know, he would do this and that. And Burton leans up and he's like, uh, what, Gary? And Gary just goes, when are you going to tell me he's here? And it, we were howling. Dude. Yeah. But that That's... was literally how Bert said it where he was like he was like the two of you were howling dude <laughs> the, you know the reason we were even on that road trip yeah if I remember correctly me Bert and Gary all tested for this show called the X show okay all right it was on it was on FX and it was a talk show uh -huh. that got that was silly and they were looking to 
<clears throat> have two people. So it was me, Gary, and Bert. Mm -hmm. So we each had our one test night. You know, it was a test deal. So just by chance, I end up getting Jesse James, the motorcycle guy. Okay. That married Sandra Bullock and blew it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did his first national TV interview. Wow. And he came on the show and they had bikes set up. And I was like, Jesse James, who the fuck is... So, and he, sh and I was like looking at the bikes and I was like, oh, I was a motor, I was a gearhead and of I course. loved motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Jesse, what's going on, man? I said, what an amazing range of bikes. I said, I noticed you got a fat boy here. You got a hard tail and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> I forget what the other one is. Oh, electric glide here, our dresser. I go, so you made these things. And he's like, yeah, where did you, so I do this whole interview with him and I knew I knew all the terminology. I knew everything about the bikes. And I'm like, I go, my man, I got, you got to show everybody your tattoo. And it had like a picture of a pistol or something. And it right. said, pay up, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, dude, it could not have gone any better. Yeah. Could not have gone any better at all. And Gary's, you know, went well. And Bert did something like he measured his penis before and yeah. then he went into a freezer and yep. measured his dick again. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so, so of course they went with Bert. <laughs> yeah. So we, well, we, we did the test deal. And then afterwards it was, you know, stressful. We were like, let's go to Vegas. So boom, we went to Vegas. And, uh, and, uh, and that was that, that time. And Gary Valentine and Bert Kreischer ended up getting those two roles, but that was, yeah. if I had to write a book uh, about my career, it would be, I was that fucking close. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. that close for many years, many that, years, but just that many inches of Burt Kreischer's dick close. Yep. <laughs> like <laughs> Perfect. But you know? we've also told the story about Aaron from the improv, putting me on this showcase yeah. in front of Mitch and then going to Montreal, changed my career. Yeah. I crushed that night and then went back and did the development deals, all that stuff. And it was, you know, it was there's a great a, time. There's a bunch of cool stuff that that has really uh that that really helped your career as well. I mean the the of course uh Aaron putting you on um but also um Chelsea putting you on as well. Yeah. Like that really benefited your career as well. And yeah. how how did that all come about? Did how did she hear about you? I went to see well I knew Chelsea when she first moved to LA we had the same manager Mark Sh Mark Shulman at 3 Arts. Yeah. Who also still represents Craig Robinson who I've known who has come out of the show who I've known yeah. uh, since since of forever. Course. So one night I one day I went with Gary to go you know when he went to do Chelsea lately sometimes we'd help him write bits me and Burton. And she come she comes into the green room and she's like what are you doing here? And I said, I just came to hang with Gary. And she's like, yeah, what's going on? We talked for a couple of minutes. And then she goes, you want to do the panel? And I said, yeah, I'd love to do the panel. And she goes, okay, well, you got to ask me. And I go, Chelsea, can I do the panel? She goes, you can be nicer than that. <laughs> I was like, you bitch. <laughs> and then she put me on the show a few times. I, and it was an adventure. You know, my first appearance was great. My second appearance, um, it was it kind of weird because I had gotten into the middle of a bit. The bit was uh, there was a certain thing about uh, shooting porn in space. Right. And I said, uh, I said, you know, the, the bit I was going to do was there's three things I like in my porn low self-esteem, bad furniture, and gravity. Right. Okay. And uh, I don't want to be in, you know, like watching the, of and course. so, but I forgot the gravity part. Right. Oh no. And, and then everybody was like, ah, oh, I don't have the punchline. And she's like, are you serious? There was something there. Uh, what was it? And then she said, well, something about, and I go, gravity, gravity. And then the crowd like booed me or whatever. And I went oh, no. what? like this. <laughs> I just went like that to the crowd. Cause I thought Chelsea would get a kick out of it. Yeah. Well, it kind of pissed her off, but then I wrote her an email and I was like, listen, I thought you'd find it edgy. You know I mean? You know, yeah. you and, and she, she was like, okay, cool. Then I did a couple more appearances and it was a lot of fun, but you know, Josh Wolf was kind of her baby and, mm -hmm. and Gary went on a lot. And so, uh, that was really fun. That's what, but Chelsea's, you know, super loyal and, and, um, and I had a great time doing that stuff. You know, it was really yeah, fun. I, that's awesome, man. I, I love that. I mean, and 
I mean, I, I'm sure having that credit certainly helped on the road and it certainly helped. Um, I mean, they, they had, I, I remember when that show was on, if any comic had that credit, like those mm-hmm. rooms were filled. Yeah, you know. it, it did help. And, you know, what's fun is that Michael Cox for a really long time was coming into the comedy lounge. And now he yeah. books. He booked that. That's yeah. why I brought him up. He booked that and he booked me on there. And he now he, you know, he books Fallon, mm-hmm. the Jimmy Fallon show. And it was funny because one night after Michael was in there, he had sent me a message uh, on Instagram. And I'm like. I go, you still had my number? And he goes, yeah. What about wow. this little beauty? And he sent the email that I had back then, S. Henry 20. It was like at AOL. Wow. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That's crazy. And so I had gotten that. So but he was a really nice guy. And, you know, and he he was, you know, on my side. But that was those were really fun. Yeah, I, I love that, man. Honestly, one of the nicest things you've ever said to me was um when i did i did a five minute set for you um and it was it was you and uh i think one of the ex executive producers of king of queens was in there as yeah, well rock rubin rock rubin yeah rock is great he's so nice um so i did it and it was really awesome because you were like man this is the first time i've ever heard you do comedy and it's exactly what I would have thought. Like, it's exactly who you are as a human mm-hmm. being. <laughs> you that's, know? that's the part. It's exactly who you are yeah. as a human being. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and th- to me, there's no better compliment because I, I started, I, I learned this maybe in my opinion too late, but, but I didn't learn it until five years in where I was just like, man, I want to be who I am off stage on stage, you know, like I, I want to be the guy that is making all my friends laugh like at the party and like is silly and stupid and all that stuff. How do I figure out how to do that on stage? You know? And then once I figured that out, everything clicked, you know? Um, and that's, and sometimes that's the hardest part, you know, that that's the hardest part of being a comedian, you know, is just finding out what your voice is, you know? Um, and then it's just writing, you know? Yeah. And Jay Leno says, um, Jay Leno would just say, he said, it takes you at least eight years to find out who you're even writing for. Yeah. And it's true. And you know, the guys and you know, the men and women, Sarah Tiana was one person we had on Mm -hmm. where, that she's woman's so work ethic. She's so funny, but her yeah. work ethic is out of control. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. She's like a killer writer, but like also has a baby. And like, <laughs> I mean, yep. she's just I mean, outrageously good. She, but she's not only outrageously good, she works so hard and she's so well liked. And, mm-hmm. you know, she's had writer for David Spade. Yep. I mean, she's got a, I think, a podcast with uh, Rob Riggle. Sure does. I think, I think it's mm-hmm. with Rob Riggle, it right? Is. Yep. She's great. Yeah. She's got a. Yeah, and then d- writes for all the roasts on Comedy Central. I mean, yep. killer. Yep. Just that's killer. another guy we had. We had uh, Chris McGuire on, who. Yeah. Um, he's done Snoop Dogg's, uh, the Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he's doing Snoop Dogg's most recent thing. He's he did Mind of Mencia. He did oh, wow. so much stuff. Yeah, so much stuff. That's killer, dude. I love that. Um, well, I do. This has been so fun, but I, I have to ask you these last two questions before I let you go. Um, so the first question is, um, what advice would you give to your younger self right now? I don't know that we have enough time for that. (laughs) Um, Get help for your anxiety. Yeah. Um, uh, I I wish I would have... I kind of, I lived every, I lived a lot of it, man. I mean, I, I I went out and I hung out and Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, you know, I would, I would say that be a little more focused. Yeah. Um, you know, a little more discipline, Mm -hmm. uh, 
spend more. I did spend a lot of time working out. I spent a lot of time working. Um, I had, I did have a plan that way. Um, but being really dedicated to the art of writing Mm -hmm. and, uh, other than that, I, I did a lot of things, right. That's good. I did a lot of things, right. And I worked hard at it and, um, but I, I could have been more focused and, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I like to have fun, man. Yeah. And so, no, I know. you know, I went out, I did my <laughs> things and we, you know, we were, you know, I mean, there was a time there where, you know, working the improv and doing all those sort of things. I mean, it was, it was, that was really, really fun times in my life. So those are the things I would, I would, you know, I would, uh, be a little more focused, uh, on what I was doing, even though, I mean, I was, but I'm talking about, like Daniel Tosh was very focused. Gary oh, yeah. Goldman was very focused. These are guys that did not go out, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever reason, they were not guys that went out. Me, Valentine, uh, Burton, Kreischer, you know, yeah. <laughs> we went out. But yeah. Bert was also, Bert was also, you know, he's a hard worker as well. Yeah, that's so. that's the thing about Bert that a lot of people – may not truly understand you definitely understand it because you've seen it firsthand but the guys the guy's brand is a to be a party animal but that guy works so hard like it's ridiculous like he basically changed touring during the pandemic like he he created the whole drive-in movie theater thing like it's crazy like i mean the guy's clearly a hard worker like you know for anyone that's like oh he's just an alcoholic or whatever like i mean call it whatever you want but the guy is successful dude he knows how to ring it in I'll tell you a story about him. When I was doing a showcase once, I was with the agency ICM, which was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, if people don't know anything about show business, there was William Morris, ICM, you know, uh, uh, UTA, p- places like that. Yeah. And and I also had a big time manager. And then uh, one night we were doing a showcase at the uh, Laugh Factory, which... <laughs> was an interesting night in itself. <laughs> um, Nick Schwartzen was on that uh, yeah. showcase. And Nick had watched the first few guys and realized that this was not the crowd that he wanted all these industry people to see yeah. him in front of. Because there was a bunch of industry people, okay? So Nick was standing there and all of a sudden I just saw him take off. And he just ran down Sunset Boulevard. And I was like, what the hell? Yeah. Nick just left. And so then I'm sitting there and I'm pacing. You know, these are nights that can change your damn life. Of course. People don't realize. I mean, these are nights that can change your life. Yep. And uh, so I'm pacing around. I'm like, oh, you know, hope I wore the right thing. And, you know, all the stupid shit you don't need in your fucking head at all. Right. Remember my act, all this stuff. And then Bert Kreischer comes rolling up, <laughs> pair of shorts, flip flops, like some raggedy ass shirt. Yeah. And he had just started comedy. He wasn't a comedian. He was like Playboy's biggest party animal or some right. shit. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. And he was just like, I go, you're going up like that? And he goes, yeah, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, why? Your shorts and flip flops and a bag of things. He's like, I don't know, man. It's just my thing. And it was his thing. And he had a yeah, plan. Sure was. And, you know, I went up and, and it was weird because a minute in, the mic cut out and oh, and no. it was weird. And rather than trusting my instincts and just going through it and plowing it and like crushing the, the, the club and everything like that, I got nervous. Instead, I was like, oh, this is my night. Can't think like that. You have to just go. Like every other night, you're like, fuck, great showcase. Mike's dead. Yeah. Who's telling me I shouldn't, you know, all right, there goes my being a star. It's over, folks. You just witnessed <laughs> my crash and burn. Yeah. Instead, they were witnessing my crash and burn that night. No. And I was trying not to acknowledge it. Oh, no. And so, so yeah, that was, that's, these are lessons you learn. But when you have really bad anxiety um, and it was a lack of confidence or whatever, too, something yeah. like that. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, so there was, there was that kind of stuff. But watching Bert, he was just like, fuck it. 
Yeah. And he just rolled. Here's the last question I have for you. Um, and I'll let you go. What do you think that that, uh, that that kid would think of who you are now, considering who your all your successes and, and all those things, what do you think they would think? Would they be proud of you? Would they I think, think you're cool? <clears throat> would I be? If I was yeah, that would, person? Yeah. Would, would, would you as a kid think that you as an adult is cool or, uh, or find or be proud of you or what, whatever? I, I would be, if I went back and you were to say, okay, you met whoever it was, somebody, mm-hmm. a, a, a psychic. Yeah. And they said, here's, here's what your life's going to be like. I think my reaction would have been like, for fucking real? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Like, I'm going to go to over 60 countries. Yeah. I'm going to have three television deals. Mm -hmm. I'm going to perform on the Celine Dion stage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open for this person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be the voice of 100 products. Yep. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah, dude. Um, Yeah. That's, That's where I would be. Hell um, yeah, dude. In, in retrospect, there's, you know, there's the part of your brain that, uh, you know, being able to do this for 33 years, it might even be 34 now. I lost track of what year it was, but it's 34. That's how old I am. So, yeah. So <laughs> you started when I was born. So, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. 34 years. So yeah. to me, there's a part of me that goes, that's success. There's a part of me that goes, you were so fucking close. Yeah. And I was like, close to what? Close to what? Dude, that right there is literally why I asked that question on this podcast. That right there. Because I have had those moments so many times where I will tell myself, man, I was so close and my life would have changed. But it's like, but you don't know that. You you really yeah. don't know that, man. I mean, do you have any idea what what like the eight-year-old version or the 10-year-old version of you that wanted to be an actor after they saw October mm-hmm. Sky would think of who you are. Like, you're on Nickelodeon. Like, you did shows yeah. for, you know, you've been on MTV. Like, you've done, you've been in things for the Jonas Brothers. You did a Super Bowl commercial. You've done whatever, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And and it's different for every actor. It's different for every actor, different for every performer, which is why mm-hmm. I always ask those questions because it's great to, um, it's great to really remember all of those things because the business is constantly telling us to forget them because it's always yeah. about what's next. And it's never about like, but what have you accomplished? Yeah. You know? And, and, you know, I was the, to put it into perspective, the, Odds of you becoming a Ray Romano right. or a Tom Cruise or a, I don't know, pick a household name. Sure. The odds of that happening. And you don't know if that would be a good thing for you. I don't know Yeah. that that guy in 19, no, 2001 uh, were to, I already, you know, with the check that I got, a lot of people don't know that when you only you sign a development deal, mm-hmm. you get a, you get a good sized check. Mm-hmm. And I paid off my debt, and I bought my the car I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, it, it, I, I, I had a lot of fun. Sure. And but I don't know what that guy had he been making twenty five grand a week and gotten famous would have done to himself. Oh yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't even know the guy in 2002, if I would have gotten that television show or 2003, I would have had a chance. I think I could have handled it that time because I dealt with two gigantic explosion failures in my life in, yeah. in my mind. Yet right. when I got all that money and all that, you know, where any comic would want, would just have one, but you don't put things into perspective because yeah. you see up here. Of course. But when I'm on in the third one, I think I would have been able to handle it and I would have done things right. Yeah. But the first two, <laughs> I might've imploded. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I mean, yeah, the, I the pressure, you. the pressure I would have been under and the money I had, 
uh, in the, I was, my feet were not on the ground. Yeah. Um, I, I, that could have gone really, really bad. So maybe that was a reason I was there. I, I know one thing, you know, I met Catherine at a crucial time and without a doubt, that is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Catherine's so there's great. That. Yeah. Catherine's great. Um, she's, uh, the brains of the operation and at least in the comedy lounge for sure. She's mm-hmm. like, yeah. she's a hard worker, man, for sure. You married a, you married Catherine, a really good person. Catherine's relentless. Dude. Yeah. You do not, you do not, you do not want to go up against this girl. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you just don't. I mean, she's done. She's, she does things, you know? Yeah. 100 percent she does man you're gonna get her best effort every single time yeah for for those that may not know uh we're talking about Catherine kamai uh who she's an actress and has been on many many different uh commercials and uh and television shows like the the csis of the world and criminal minds things like that uh phenomenal actress um but yeah she's also part of the the comedy lounge on the on the the marketing side, on the technical side, on the everything side, I mean, she's on a whole bunch of side. Yeah, on, a whole bunch on, of sides, a whole bunch. Man. Yeah, she's organizing the, everything. I mean, she's yeah. she is what you say. And now our friend Ewan is really stepped up, and he's doing a lot of stuff. And it's it's yeah. you know, but Catherine is uh, my my friend KP Anderson said it best at my wedding. He goes, Scott Henry's decisions got a lot better after he met Catherine Kamei. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That's the truth. I love that. And that's that's actually a perfect place to end it. At least I think so. Um, where can people find you online, Scott? Uh, at Scott Henry uh, Comedy. Yeah. Uh, on Instagram, I think. I, I think it's at Scott Henry Comedy. It, it might be just at Scott Henry. Yeah. And so uh, same thing in all my stuff. Um so, uh, you know, please follow me. Keep track of what's going on. Come on into the Comedy Lounge or listen to our podcast when we launch it. Yeah. When we launch it, you'll know. That is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week. Bye, besties. 